Hello, and welcome to Vivork. I'm Brian Watrous. This is the final video in a nine-part video series in which we have been exploring how to build a VRO lab environment on top of VMware Fusion. In this video, what we're going to be doing is taking the lab environment that we've built in the previous eight videos, and in that environment, we're going to create an orchestrator workflow, and we're going to run it. All right, everyone, the big moment has arrived. You've gone through eight previous videos in this video series, and now it's time to put it all together and create an orchestrator workflow and run it. So I hope you're excited. I am. Let's dive in. Uh, as you can see here, I'm already in my Windows VM. I'm already logged into the orchestrator client. If you don't know how to do that, take a look at the previous video. Video number eight in this series shows you how to log in. I'm logged in, and the first thing I'm going to do is First thing I always do is go up to this drop-down list and I switch from the default view of run and I switch to design. If you want to know why I'm doing that and what the difference is between run and design and administer, join me in the classroom and I'll teach you all about that. But for our purposes, for this video, we're just going to choose design. And here on the workflows tab, there's a bunch of different tabs. They each have a tooltip that tells you what they are. But we're just going to go here to the workflows tab. And in the workflows tab, as you can see, we already have a library of tons and tons of workflows that are already written for us. So for instance, if we wanted to do something like power on a VM, the vCenter plugin for Orchestrator lets you do things to virtual machines. For instance, you can manage a virtual machine's power and do things like, where is it, where is it, where is it? We could do things like start a virtual machine. So this thing here, this little blue icon, is indicating an orchestrator workflow. And we could run it, but I don't want to run one of these existing workflows. I want to show you quickly here how to create your own orchestrator workflow. Because um, ultimately, I, I, want, I want to get people excited about doing that. So I'm going to create an orchestrator workflow. Conceivably, I could put that orchestrator workflow into the same library folder, but I like keeping my stuff organized. So the first thing I'm going to do is create my own folder. By right-clicking the topmost entry here, the one with the orange icon, I'll right-click, and I'm going to choose Add Folder. And I could call this folder anything I want. I, I feel like calling mine vvork.info. Uh, you could call yours your name. You could call yours my workflows. You could call the folder whatever you want. It's just to keep things organized. And within that folder, if I want to, I can create subfolders. You just right-click the folder, choose add folder again. So you can create subfolders to keep things nicely organized. Um, that's not going to be necessary for our purposes here. What we need to do is to create that orchestrator workflow we're talking about. Now this is not going to be the most exciting workflow in the world. If you want to learn how to create more exciting workflows, join me in the classroom or watch some of my other videos. Um, and you, you can learn all sorts of things about creating workflows. But we're going to create a simple workflow uh, in the tradition of computer programming, this is going to be a hello world type workflow. All this workflow is going to do is it's going to send a message that says hello world. Again, not meant to be exciting. It's not exciting. Not meant to be exciting. It's just meant to illustrate some of the basic mechanics of creating and running workflows. So to create a workflow, we're going to right click on this folder and choose new workflow. Then we'll name our workflow. I'm going to call mine hello world. I'll click OK. And uh, if you watch real closely here, uh, watch what happens with, to this background here. Uh, notice that right now there's this lovely blue background. Uh, the reason why I'm pointing that out is when we click OK to create this new workflow, it's actually going to switch modes. We're no longer on the main screen. The main screen has the blue border. We're now in an editing window, actually editing a specific workflow. Which workflow? Well, here's its name. If we want to change the name, this is where you do that. Uh, you and I will refer to workflows by their name, but uh, later on, uh, there may be situations where you need to call a workflow by its ID. If you want to know what that ID is and when you use it and so forth, again, join me in the classroom. We have to teach you. But a whole bunch of stuff here on this general tab that we could set up. A bunch of stuff I could teach you about. But the main thing I want to teach you about is this description field. You should always type descriptions. I know it seems unmanly to type descriptions. It seems almost as bad as stopping and asking for directions or using a map. But as orchestrator developers, good orchestrator developers always type descriptions. Not just here on the general tab, but other places where they see description fields. So let me type one real quickly here. This workflow says, hello world. That's what this workflow is going to do. 
tell you, I saved myself a little typing here. I'm going to copy that so I won't have to type that again here in a moment. Now, this is just a description. It doesn't actually make the workflow do anything. Uh, it's just a description. I'm going to skip over the Inputs tab and the Outputs tab and all, all these other tabs. If you want to learn about them, again, join me in the classroom or watch my videos. And I'm going to jump to the Schema tab where we see something called the Schema. Uh, this thing here looks like a flowchart, uh, sometimes called a workflow. It's actually called the Schema. And that Schema instructs Orchestrator what to do when running this workflow. And as you can see, there's a whole bunch of Schema elements over here on the left side broken up into different sections here, so there's perhaps more schema elements here than you than first meets the eye, but there's a bunch of schema elements. Uh, I'm just going to pick one called the scriptable task. Now, as you might guess from the name scriptable task, this is going to allow me to type some script, specifically JavaScript code, to tell the workflow what I want it to do. And in that sense, this is a really bad example to start off with this hello world thing because one of the things I uh, tried to get people to understand about Orchestrator when they first start using it is in many cases you're not going to have to write any code at all. Uh, in the case of this particular workflow I do have to write some code so I am going to use a scriptable task. But if I wanted to do something like power in a virtual machine I don't have to write any code at all. If I want to create a cluster in Orchestrator I don't have to write any code at all. Um, if that sounds exciting to be able to do all sorts of Orchestrator, excuse me, vCenter things with within orchestrator workflows, if that sounds exciting, to be able to do stuff like that, not just with vCenter, but other parts of your IT infrastructure. If you like the idea of being able to automate your environment, uh, oftentimes without even having to write a single line of code, then you're going to want to continue onwards in your orchestrator career, either teach yourself or watch my videos or come to class and learn how to use uh, orchestrator to do fancier things than, say, hello world. All right, so enough yakking. I'm going to drag, I'm going to click and drag the scriptable task over from the left side, and I'm going to drop it into my workflow. I'm dropping it right on that arrow. Uh, those blue arrows that you see, by the way, uh, indicate the normal flow through this workflow. Uh, this schema element and all schema elements uh, of type scriptable task are labeled scriptable task by default. Uh, you can change that label if you want. Just double click it and type a better name. For instance, the point of this schema element is it's going to say hello. So I'm just going to change the label to make this workflow easier to understand. Now to actually put some code in here, I'm going to click on the edit button. That's the little pencil button. Uh, notice, by the way, instead I could select the schema element and type control E. Orchestrator has all sorts of shortcuts like that, but one way or another I need to edit the schema element. I'll click the pencil icon, and up pops another window in which there's more tabs. Again, come to class. I can teach you about the tabs, but we're going to... Oh, here's a description field. Always type a description. This schema element says, hello world. Okay, always type descriptions. We're going to skip over all these tabs and jump straight to this one labeled scripting. And in here, I'm going to type some code. Let me resize this. Uh, by the way, this stuff over here on the left side is called the API Explorer. Uh, again, watch my other videos, come to class, we, you can learn about that. But I'm just going to type some code here. The code that I'm typing is in JavaScript. The code, if ever you're typing code into an orchestrator workflow, the code is going to be in JavaScript. Now, you don't have to know a whole lot about JavaScript to be a good orchestrator developer. You need to know essentially the basics of JavaScript. Uh, if you want to know more about JavaScript, pick up a book on JavaScript or uh, take a look at any of the numerous tutorials online about JavaScript. Um, I'll, if, if I remember, remind me if I forget, but if I remember, I'll put some, uh, some uh, URLs down in the YouTube comments that uh, will give you some uh, good places that you could go for JavaScript um, tutorials. But... You don't have to know everything about JavaScript. Uh, whatever, wherever you're learning about JavaScript, uh, be aware that it's the basics of JavaScript that you need to know. You need to know how, how do variables work in JavaScript? How, how do I create an if-then statement? How do I create a loop? It's, it's those basics that you need to know. Uh, if you pick up a book on JavaScript, it'll probably be about 400 pages long. Rip out the last 300 pages, because those pages are talking about things that are going to be irrelevant to Orchestrator. Uh, the reason why I say that is Orchestrator is a headless 
environment. Much like if you go into a data center and you see all those servers. Have you ever gone into a data center, saw all those servers, and noticed that there's no monitors because the monitors are headless? Same sort of deal with Orchestrator. There, there is no monitor, or at least you should assume there's no monitor uh, for Orchestrator. There's no place where we can pop up this message that says, uh, hello world. That's why I'm not printing hello world or writing hello world to the screen. That's why I'm logging it to a, a, a log file. But anyways, this is the JavaScript code that you need to type in order to send a message to a log file in Orchestrator. A few comments about this code here. If you know what object-oriented programming is, system is an object it can t that's automatically instantiated for you in your workflow. It contains a method called .log. Again, there's more to the story than just this, but uh, if you know about object-oriented programming, um, JavaScript and or therefore Orchestrator are object-oriented. Uh, we have objects, we have classes, we have uh, methods, we have properties, all the usual stuff that you're expecting. Uh, if you don't understand all of that, that's totally fine. Uh, if you are going to start typing some JavaScript code in, please be aware that JavaScript is a case-sensitive language. So I don't know if you noticed this here, but notice when I type system that I made that first letter a capital S. If I had failed and made it lowercase s, this code would not work. JavaScript is case sensitive. Okay, so I've typed some code here. I'm going to close this editing window. And I'm going to go up to this validate button. Uh, before I run a workflow, I'm going to click the validate button to make certain that everything looks good. So I click the validate button. And in this case, my workflow looks good. I'll click close. You can run a workflow from within this editor. Uh, for reasons I'm not going to share right now, um, no, I'll talk offline. I'll tell you sometime later, but for reasons uh, I'm not going to go into right now, I'm not going to run the workflow from in here. I'm going to instead click Save and Close. That saves the workflow. Gives me the opportunity to bump up the version number of the workflow. I'll go ahead and save and do that. We talk about versioning in, in class. But here I am back on the main screen. That the, the reason why I'm not having you run the workflow from within the editor itself is I want to make certain that you know that if you're on the main screen and you want to edit the workflow again, you need to select the workflow and click edit to get back into that mode. All right, so good enough. Uh, let me save and close again. From this uh, main screen or from within the editor, there are various ways you can run the workflow. You can select the workflow and click the start button, or you can right-click the workflow. You can right-click the workflow, and there's a bunch of start options, including start workflow. This here and this choice here do the same thing, or you can type Control-R. whole bunch of ways you can run workflows, but let's run it. So I run the workflow. Uh, by the way, this entry here is a workflow. Let me highlight that again. This is a workflow. And what just got created when I ran the workflow is something called a workflow token. Now, again, we can talk about workflow tokens in class or watch my other videos, but this workflow token has a green check mark, which indicates that this workflow ran successfully. I can also tell it ran successfully if I go down to the general tab, I can see that it, it, com it completed successfully. But what I want to do here is jump over to the logs tab. Now I know I told you a few moments ago that Orchestrator is headless, and I want you to think of Orchestrator as headless. I don't want you to assume that, that you can just print messages to the screen. Uh, even though I'm going to show you, it's going to sh that message is going to show up here. You need to think of Orchestrator as headless. Again, that's a that's, uh, topic for an offline discussion, though. Let's click the Logs tab. And what do we see? We see the Hello World message that our workflow was designed to print. Now, again, didn't print it to the monitor, put it in the log. If we went in the log files, we'd see that message. But I think we now have definitive proof that our orchestrator workflow is working, our orchestrator server is working, our vCenter server is working, our whole VRO lab environment that we built on top of VMware Fusion is now working. So that means we've reached the end of this video series. Uh, I'd love to hear back from you guys if you have any questions or comments about the videos. I've got commenting open in the YouTube uh, window, so go ahead and let me know. If this worked for you, great. If not, if you have any questions, let me know. But thanks for sticking through these nine videos. There's going to be, there already are, and there are going to be a lot more videos at vvork.info and at my YouTube channel. So stay, stay, stick around, watch some more videos, learn about Orchestrator, and hope to see you in class one day. So talk to you guys later.